Hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for this HLPF side event entitled Parliament's Role in Linking Good, Gov good Go Security Sector Governance to SDG 16 amid COVID-19. My name is uh, Hans Born. I'm Head of Policy and Research Division, and it is my great honor to moderate this uh, event. This is, side event is co-hosted by Costa Rica and, and DCAF, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, in collaboration with Georgia, Nepal, and with support of the Netherlands. We have a great attendance with over 150 individuals who have signed up, including uh, more than 20 missions to the UN, representatives of uh, 10 international organizations, as well as many representatives of capitals, national security institutions, such as the police, as well as academia and experts. So I will now pass the floor to Ambassador Rodrigo Carazo, permanent representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations, to provide the welcome re remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. As ambassador of Costa Rica, as well as a former parliamentarian, I am very honored uh, to give these words of a uh, introduction on the relationship between peace, security, and sustainable development, uh, as it, it is embodied in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And to uh, give a few words on how uh, parliaments, which are definitely the most uh, prominent and democratic uh, oversight bodies uh, of any state play a role in creating the conditions uh, for peaceful, resilient, inclusive, and just societies. I would like to express my appreciation to Ambassador Gerber, to uh, Director of the CAF, uh, and to Hans Born and its team for partnering uh, with us, with Costa Rica, in order to make uh, this event uh, possible. And special thanks and special welcome uh, to members of the uh, parliament of Georgia and Nepal, and of my own country, uh, of course, who will share with us some of their experiences and insights from their national uh, con context. Costa Rica proudly believes uh, that the prevention of conflicts and the creation of conditions for a culture of peace require democratic, inclusive, and accountable institutions, as well as public policies and investments that serve the purposes of social welfare and human security. And thus, the participation of the people in the decisions that affect their lives and livelihoods directly and through parliaments is indispensable. This also applies, of course, to the Security Council, security sector, where the government of Costa Rica is striving for guiding its policies with, with special focus on prevention. In this regard, with abundant evidence on the pervasive effects of arms pro proliferation for human security. Last year, Costa Rica adopted a number of regulations for arm, arms uh, controls, small arms all the time, and the protection of women and girls from firearms. Personally, I envision the moment in which all arms will be silenced in my, in my country as it was done uh, 72 years ago uh, when we abolished the, the armed forces. Today, our country will be presented, presenting here in New York its second national voluntary national report on the fulfillment of the development goals. And this presentation will account, among other things, for the specific interventions uh, on uh, public safety preventions and the promotion of a safe and inclusive public spaces. Welcome again uh, to this discussion uh, for which uh, we wish the best for all participants. Ambassador Carasso, thank you so much for your introductory remarks. And we will now turn to Ambassador Thomas Gerber, Director of DICAF. Thomas, the floor is yours. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, a very warm welcome to all of you. I would first like to thank Ambassador Rodrigo Carrazzo from the Permanent Mission of Costa Rica and his staff for their terrific assistance in making this side event possible by officially sponsoring it. It was almost exactly a year ago at last year's HLPF when the idea for this side event was first born. So I'm extremely pleased to see it come to fruition today. I would also like to thank the Dutch, Georgian and Nepalese permanent missions to the United Nations for co-sponsoring the event. In particular, let me thank the Dutch permanent mission for being gracious enough to vacate its speaking slot to allow a little bit more time for discussion among the audience later on. So thank you very much for this. My name is Thomas Gerber. I'm the director of DCAF, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, uh, an organization based in Geneva, but we're operationally engaged in more than 80 countries worldwide. And at DCAF, we're dedicated to improving the security of states as well as people within a framework of democratic governance, the rule of law and respect for human rights. We believe that inclusive, locally owned security sector governance and reform is a vital pillar and indeed a precondition for sustainable peace and development. This year, we have embarked on a new long-term project, which is generally supported by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It, it tries to build a better understanding and more solid evidence to understand how exactly security sector governance and reform contributes to sustainable development and peace, and how such efforts can be improved. We will hear more about this when my colleague, Alexandre Préperier, provides some initial insights into a study analyzing how the voluntary national reviews to date relate to security sector governance and reform. In addition, this project will highlight how several key oversight actors, and in particular parliaments, on which we're focusing today, are already doing a terrific job in this area by consciously linking their work to the SDGs. While it is unfortunate indeed that we cannot physically meet in New York today, I'm pleased to see how we've been able jointly to overcome some of the obstacles posed by the coronavirus. By holding this meeting virtually, we're able to reach a much wider and much more diverse audience across the globe. I hope that having such a truly global audience will enrich the discussions which will take place during the Q&A part towards the end of the, of the event. In keeping with the theme of overcoming obstacles, I'm personally eager to learn more from our distinguished panelists about their experiences in coping with the challenges created by COVID-19 as parliamentarians, and to see what they're currently doing to create more peaceful, just and inclusive societies. So I wish all of us a stimulating discussion and event. Thank you very much. Thomas, thank you so much for your introductory remarks. I will be now introducing our panelists in a, in a second, but before I would like to briefly present the format of this uh, webinar. So we will start with a panel discussion where our distinguished panelists, and these are members of parliament from three countries, Costa Rica, Georgia, and Nepal, will share with us several experiences and mechanisms to promote security, justice, and SDG 16. This will be followed by a Q&A session where you will be able to share comments and ask questions to our speakers. The entire event will be recorded and posted online shortly after the event. The link to the video will be sent to everyone who is attending this seminar. If there is sufficient interest from the audience, we also may extend the end time of this webinar past one hour, but no longer than 30 extra minutes. You, the audience, may submit your questions to the members of parliament, the speakers, via the same link on Slido. So please visit slido.com and enter the code HLPF to be able to submit questions. We have already received a few questions via the registration, but you're very welcome to add additional questions. In addition, everyone may then, may then like the questions 
the submitted questions they find the most interesting and the most popular questions will be asked when we arrive at the Q&A. There are also instructions on how to access Slido in the chat, uh, which you can view by clicking chat at the bottom of your screen. So follow that uh, link and then you can submit uh, further questions via Slido. With that in mind, before the event began, we, we asked you to answer where you are from. And uh, I think we can see, we will share now a screen where you can see uh, who has uh, attended the, uh, uh, who's attending the seminar. You can see it's really a wide variety of, of, of countries and it is very diverse as, and, and, as diverse and international as the panel that we have uh, uh, today. So without further ado, I will move to the first questions and to introduce the MPs in, in sequence. So uh, we come to the first question, uh, which SDG target do you contribute to as member of parliament? This question I will ask to each of the panelists and I will start with uh, Mrs. Perez. Mrs. Nielsen Perez is a specialist in human rights and a political participation of women and gender equality. She has a degree in social work from the University of Costa Rica and a master's in gender, society and politics from Flasco, Argentina. At the moment, she is a member of parliament of the Republic of Costa Rica and as part of her responsibility, she is the chair, the president of the special permanent committee of the parliament on women. And also she is the chair of the special permanent committee of parliament on human rights. She has extensive work experience in human rights, political participation and empowerment of women and girls, gender equality and local policies for equality. So Mrs. Uh, Perez, may I welcome you here uh, cordially and also thank you so much for waking up so early as I understand it is around six o'clock in San Jose. So thank you so very much. So the first question is for you, uh, Mrs. Nielsen Perez, which SDG targets do you contribute to as member of parliament? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator Hans Born. I want to start by thanking, thanking the organizers of this event for the opportunity to provide to share my experience. Special greeting to our ambassador, Mr. Carazo, and also want to greet the panelists present in this virtual space as well as this broad and global audience that accompanies us today. As part of my parliamentary responsibilities, I contribute to several of the goals of the SDG 16 because among my priorities line of work are the human rights of all people, especially women and girls, and the inclusion of people in condition of poverty and vulnerability. To put this in context, our parliament is multi-party, uh, consists of seven political parties, the parliament is made up of 46% women and 54% men. It is the parliament with the highest number of women in our history. And in addition, it has the largest number of young people. They are very important for us. As country, we have in recent years been going through a very difficult moment of social polarization because of the presence of groups with fundamentalist and backwards position of human rights and women's rights. So we have had to review and renew our principles and values of being Costa Rican. Peace. The number one is peace. 71 years ago, we abolished the army. 71 years of working in a culture of peace and we continue to build it day by day. The number two, raise the human rights of people. Our motto, all right for all people. Discrimination is not accepted for any reason. The number three, protection of the environment and climate change. And the number four, a strong democratic institution. Characteristic of a social state of law this also includes the importance of multilateralism. Therefore, principles are the source of our work to continue having a strong state of law 
in social responsibility central to achieve SDG 16. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Nilton Perez. So we can now go to the uh, second speaker, uh, uh, and she's Mrs. Sophie Kalatze. She's since 2016 a member of Parliament of Georgia and holds the position of chairperson of the Human Rights and Civil Integration Committee of the Parliament. She started her career in Georgia as a lecturer for the master's program LLM to Köln at Tbilisi State University, while also giving lectures at Grigor Robakitze University. In 2012, Mrs. Kilatsu became the head of the International Legal Cooperation Division at the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Georgia. In 2014, she was appointed as Deputy Director of the Ministry of the Interior Police Ac Academy. Since 2016, Mrs. Sofli Klasse has a prominent experience of working in Germany after graduating from Ruprecht Karls University in Heidelberg in Germany, and she is continuing also her occupation as Max, at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. So Mrs. Uh, uh, Kilatsu, we, we come now to you. So I would like also to ask you, which SDG 16 targets do you contribute to as a member of parliament in Georgia? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Porn. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have possibility to speak the second time at this uh, very important uh, side event uh, about uh, SDG 16, which is very important. And uh, um, as a citizen and a member of parliament, I share the values of SDGs and try to apply them in my everyday, uh, as well as in the parliamentary life along with other respected goals, the rule of law, developing effective, accountable and transparent institutions, raising public access to information and protect fundamental rights, promoting the participation of my country in the institutions of global governance are among the, my major interests of SDG 16. Parliament of Georgia as the core institution of the Parliamentary Republic is accountable for establishing strong supervisory mechanisms along with its initial lawmaking activities. In line with this uh, principle, we made a number of changes in the national legislation to strengthen the role of parliamentary oversight, including UN obligations. Since 2016, the Committee on the, uh, of Human Rights and Civil Integration, the one I'm chairing, links its activities of the annual action plan with the SDGs. This way, we try to keep the national measures in strong connection with global challenges. The committee as well dedicates special hearings to UPR reports, reports on the execution of the UN Committee's decision to Georgia. To ensure the full picture of the human rights situation in the country, we ask CSOs for their alternative reports, which are examined and considered in the committee conclusions. We are also actively engaged with promotion, uh, promotion of SDGs at national and international level. Georgia is an active member of such global initiatives as 16 Plus Forum and uh, Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies to support the successful implementation of the SDG 16 globally. In this respect, the main purpose of the Georgia's OGP, it means Open Government uh, Partnership Chairmanship in 2018, was also the strengthening of basic, basics of, uh, of open government that is crucial for implementation of the SDG 16 and the World 2030 Agenda. As re-elected member of the OGP steering committee, Georgia will continue our efforts to this end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Sofie Kalatz from Tbilisi in, in Georgia for your inf insightful uh, comments. We come now to the third speaker, which is Dr. Bhatt, who speaks to us from Kathmandu in Nepal. The Honorable Dr. Bhatt is a member of the Federal Parliament of Nepal and a member of its International Res Relations Committee. Recently, he has, he has contributed to drafting Nepal's national security policy and was a member of the high-level task force on reorienting Nepal's foreign policy. 
Dr. Bart is also the founding director of the Nepal Center for Security Governance since May 2016, and he has been carrying out various security-related research and policy work since uh, uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, he holds a PhD in international relations from the South Asian Division uh, School of International Studies from Yavaralu Nehru University in New Delhi. Dr. Bart, so we come to you uh, with the same question. Uh, can you please share with us uh, which SDG targets did you do you prioritize and do you contribute to as a member of parliament? Thank you. Thank you, yep. uh, moderator Hans Bahn, Excellencies, and all participants. It's my pleasure to be here in the panel for the second time where we are talking about the parliamentarian's role in linking with, I mean, linking security sector governance to the SDGs and its relation amid COVID-19. So first of all, I would like to thank organizers. And as we heard from two parliamentarians from Costa Rica and Georgia, uh, the situation is a bit difficult globally. And when talking from Kathmandu, Nepal, here as a, uh, a member of parliament here, I'm working with all the people from academia, you know, some from civil society and private sector, how to cope up with the situation. And our parliamentary session, and especially the budgetary session was ongoing. and. It was ended last week and I was actively working to link our new federal setup as for the last seven decades, Nepal has been, you know, meddling with the political instability and none a government in the last seven decades have performed or, you know, can deliver for its full tenure. So we are hoping this particular government will deliver for the first time in history. So it is uh, political stability and at the same time we have entered into the federalized state so there are seven provinces and the seven parliaments at the provinces and 753 local governments so in i mean linking and making stability and effective parliaments and effective local bodies is the main target which will help you know making stable and strong institutions you know sdg 16 6 is the is the you know directly uh, link in this context and Amid this, you know, deepening the relation of the parliament, as I mentioned, you know, the, uh, you know, those who are working on the different platforms, uh, you know, from the, uh, 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 to contribute to the peace and sustainable development. This is how uh, I have been active. And at the, at the same time, uh, as I said, it is the end of the fiscal year in our context. So uh, the budget, which have been seen that is not effective and you know, mostly the development activities are occurring at the end or especially the two or three or four months of the, this particular season. So we are, you know, making that these institutions or development activities, activities should be, you know, you know, uh, you know, focus or, you know, perform all around the year, not only the three or four months as we have seen in the past. So diversifying that mechanism is, is one very important thing here. So closely, you know, like building institutions or the stronger institutions is is there and linking it with the newly established federal setup is there. So the my message, I know my experience here, you know, like, like to accelerate joint exercises and learning from other sectors and bringing them uh, and to promote, uh, promote and, you know, peace and stability in an integrated form uh, is there. So that is what I have been, you know, doing uh, during this uh, period. So that is my experience. So I will stop here and will be happy to uh, respond any query and question later. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. But thank you so much for your uh, uh, insights. And you have actually illustrated that your work is actually, by and large, very much focusing on uh, on building up strong and accountable institutions, which is 16.6 .6 
in the targets of the SDG 16 and also you are making an effort to include local governance and governments and cities into decision making which very much refers to inclusive decision making so you have also referred to and all of you have done that to the very difficult situation that you are now in uh, as, as part of the COVID-19 uh, so this would be actually my my second question to the three panelists, and we go through them in reverse order. So I will start start now with Dr. Deepak Bhatt of Nepal, and the question is, how has your work in contributing to SDG 16 to peaceful, inclusive, and just societies? How has your work been impacted by the current pandemic, by the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Deepak, but may, may I start with you? Could you say a little bit how, how this whole COVID-19 has uh, impacted on your work? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Uh, Ernst, it uh, COVID-19 has become a you know, challenge for the whole human uh, civilization at this moment. And in Nepal, uh, the cases have gone up to the 35,000 plus, and but the death ratio is, is small now, 39 only. But uh, we are hoping because as if you look at the Nepal and its geography, we have an open and the porous border with India and the larger and the very large population of India has been already suffering with and, and with this transmission. And, and millions of Nepalese migrants workers have been working in India and, and many of them have come back uh, to their uh, hometowns and the uh, villages uh, because of that we see that it's it's challenge and no it's not because of that but uh, the people of course they want to come back to the home and then live with the family in this pandemic situation and now while talking about the good governance practices and then linking you know uh, our experience or you know our institutions with uh, with this new federal setup uh, to respond this challenge uh, we at the federal level work with uh, uh, creation of some new, new mechanisms at central level, uh, which is like, you know, the uh, committee to respond to COVID-19 and management related uh, works and uh, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Home Affairs and Ministry of Defense and all security uh, institutions come under that uh, CCMC or centrally formed new mechanism and working through that we have uh, institutions working at up to the local government level or the city's level and province of course the provincial level so making a structure and implementing through and delivering the relief work and you know making the holding centers quarantines and and then making and going for the rdt tests or the pcr the swab tests all these things and though we haven't declared the health emergency but the situation is like that and the security forces are working at the forefront and especially the uh, armed police force and the nepal police these two institutions of course the nepal army has been you know given a very special task to bring uh, equipments uh, from uh, any country or especially in this need of this condition from china uh, and giving a procurement authority or a mechanism from the uh, government to government process and others also and in the border areas where well, people are coming back and going india because millions indian workers are also were also working uh, are also working in nepal so you know going and coming of the these migrant workers was a big challenge at the border so and for the border security purposes we have deployed the armed police force so they have been having a big problem because they have to face you know both way the providing security you know like convincing people and of course protecting themselves from this pandemic so this is a very complex situation but uh, we promo we were promoting as you know like the peaceful coming and going mechanisms holding centers quarantines though they were very poorly equipped not very sophisticated but gradually now we can see that for example in our province uh, from 68,000, the number in the quarantine people are only 5,000. Daily test has gone rise, rise up, and now that is about 500 per day. So this is how we are working, and and that we can see that institutions are you know learning day by day and making them uh, you know performing well uh, in that condition. So uh, and parliamentary responsibilities. This parliamentary session was going on, so we have been discussing in the parliament, parliamentary committees you know, back and forth with the ministries, concerned ministries, concerned communities or concerned departments we have. So, you know, this is so the everything was seen like, you know, 
uh, role of the parliament and government, you know, like as an oversight mechanism, budgetary part, legislative part, all these things were uh, simultaneously going. So uh, I'm happy, not, you know, uh, satisfactory at highest level, but uh, partially we have performed well. And now, uh, as the parliamentary session is over last week, uh, most of the parliamentarians will be at the constituencies and back at home and working at the uh, local level. So this is the Nepali experience I want to share here. Thank you, Hans. Again. Thank you, Dr. Deepak Bhatt, for sharing this with us. And I understand that you have actually said that the parliament, as good as it can, maintains its oversight function over all the work of the government, including lawmaking functions, budget functions. You also underlined that the security sector, the police and armed forces do play a, a major role in here uh, in, in the situation. But nevertheless, there is no situation of a, a national emergency declared yet. And I think you also, for, also illustrated so well that you are also grappling with uh, what to do with the borders. They need to be opened for, to, to maintain the economy, but at the same time, it can be also impacting on, on the health. So thank you so much. So we go now uh, to the situation in Georgia, and we, I would like to ask Mrs. Kilats of the Georgian Parliament it, just to illustrate for us and uh, how the work, how COVID-19 has impacted uh, your work, and maybe you can also share with us how you have tried to mediate this. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, like elsewhere, pandemic uh, has changed the way of living uh, and professional routine in Georgia, and most of meetings, conferences, and events are held uh, online. We do our best not to leave anyone beyond the process and offer alternative platforms for participation. Uh, of course, regarding the you know, security sector, we have continued our work, also partially online, uh, to, uh, um, to make uh, concrete steps regarding budget because we had to change budgets, uh, of course, uh, also for security sectors, uh, um, and we have tried to balance not to damage also the purposes and goals of uh, security sector, police, defense, etc., etc., but some changes we'd had to uh, undertake, of course, um, and uh, also um, we have continued so the committee hearings also in, in the process of um, COVID-19 uh, period um, to, to uh, make main accent on concrete uh, uh, steps uh, in order to ensure the well-being of, um, uh, of our people. Um, and uh, one more important issue what I would uh, like to underline is that uh, a few months ago, Georgian Parliament adopted the Code on the Rights of the Child and the law envisages the holistic view of child protection and care and create the frame of all national child relative legislation, uh, but uh, from April 27, 2020, a child helpline was launched in, uh, in connection with the, uh, in connection with the uh, child code as a prompt and effective response to the child relative issue during the COVID-19 pandemic. The helpline serves social, educational, health, uh, violence, and other child relative issues, providing them with all relative state services. Therefore, the hotline ensures the increased access of children and their families to the service available in the country. The project initiated by the Human Rights Committee of the Parliament of Georgia, carried out with the support of UNICEF and Social Care Agency, will serve the citizens um, during the entire 2020. Since 27th of April, the Child Health Plan provided uh, supportive services uh, to hundreds of children and their families uh, from January 2021. The state will ensure the uninterrupted operating of the helpline in accordance with the uh, Code of the Rights of the Child. Uh, tomorrow, in cooperation with UNICEF, we shall announce the launch of another project, Helpline for Adolescents and Youth with Gambling and Substance uh, Addiction, a group of operators and psychologists will work to help these individuals and their family members overcome the troubles they are facing because uh, um, maybe you are aware also this uh, is a huge issue for our country and affects also the security sector uh, partially. Uh, so these experiences show how the challenge opens the door uh, wide to the new 
opportunities also for parliaments and parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Galazzo, for your insights from from Georgia. And I see that you have also taken into account uh, within Parliament the, the, the budgetary issue uh, of funding various sectors, uh, uh, as well as you have also underlined that the committee hearings uh, continue. I also thought it was very help, uh, interesting to see these new initiatives such as helplines for adolescents that you have uh, 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 displayed, uh, uh, also portraying a sort of more broader uh, definition of security, uh, human security. So uh, before I go to uh, Mrs. Perez, uh, uh, I would like also to, uh, 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 to remind the audience that you can um, add questions via slido.com and type in the keyword HLPF for those who enter this uh, webinar later on. There are already quite a few questions lined up and we will, these questions from the audience, we will uh, uh, share them with the, with the speakers to be answered after the, their presentation. So now I would like to turn to Mrs. Nielsen Perez of Costa Rica and also to ask you, uh, how has your work uh, in contributing to the SDG 16 Peaceful and Just and Inclusive Society, how has your work been impacted by the COVID-19 crisis? The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, in the context of COVID-19, my work as a parliamentarian has been impacted, among which um, I highlight Combining virtual and face-to-face -face sessions, this has meant acceleration in the use of technological tools for communication, increased the level of dialogue and negotiation between parliamentarians, uh, because decreasing the participation of advisors for the uh, sanitary measures, uh, modify the regulation of the parliament to shorten the time to know uh, for no and approval of extraordinary budgets for the attention of the national emergency by COVID-19 and to be able to meet virtually. Um, we, have, we have also had to accelerate the knowledge and approval of legislation on emergency to protect families, people's employment, business, and um, state finances. Some examples. Reform of labor legislation to include the reduction of the work days as an option for people not to be laid off from their jobs. An extension in the payment of taxes and fees and fees for companies. Uh, sanction for not compliance with the car restriction and health measures interposed by the Minister of Health. A strengthening mechanism for monitoring and control of public resources aimed at protection of people who have had their income reduced. Uh, despite the fact that some parliamentarians have put forward proposals to limit freedoms and rights, this has not been necessary because decision made in this case is based on techniques and science. If our Minister of Health requires it, we will be evaluating it. This emergency has revealed a series of problems that we have been dragging out and not attending sufficiently well because of the structural inequalities that we have, like poverty and discrimination. There are many problems that that have become apparent, generating more citizen awareness of their existence, and we must find a way to solve these problems. We have a state of law in social responsibility with very solid institutions and with a lot of legit legitimacy that have managed that to address the urgency of the problem. But as a society, we have to work in the construction of a new social contract, strengthening our state of law and social responsibility and the efficiency and quality of public services of our democratic institution. It is a, a part of the experience. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nielsen Perez. I think I think it was very good that you have also uh, highlighted uh, how you have tried to continue to do to your work, and you have also, which I thought was very interesting, uh, pointed your finger on the knock-on effects from the COVID-19, such as increased poverty and discrimination. And I think this uh, gives also a duty to the security providers who assist the state in the case of Costa Rica, the police, uh, most likely, that they will also apply. Uh, 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 their, their services and their contacts with the citizens uh, without dim discrimination. So I, th I think also what was interesting that you have emphasized, maybe we need a sort of new contract between citizen and the state after this COVID-19 so that the lessons learned are all not only on a technical level, but also more on a, on a strategic level. I thought that was extremely interesting. So thank you so much. We come now to the last uh, uh, question. And before I, I will put forward the last question to the to the speakers which is about the voluntary national reviews how states uh, report on achieving the SDG 16. I, I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, my colleague Alexandra Treprier. She is a researcher at, at DCAF and she will share with us the preliminary findings of our research on how states report on SDG 16 security sector governance and parliaments in the voluntary national review. So before we go to the to the three speakers, we give you a short snapshot from uh, preliminary findings from our research. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. As you mentioned, in the context of a larger project on SDG 16, DCAF is currently conducting an analysis of the VNRs to date. The aim of this study is to analyze how VNRs have engaged on SSGR and to what extent SSGR is used as a policy tool to address the interlinkages between security and sustainable development in the context of the 2030 Agenda. The research um, focuses on VNRs produced between 2016 and 2019, and it therefore doesn't cover the VNRs that are currently being presented at this year's HLPF. I'll present some of the preliminary findings of the analysis today, but just before that, I want to point out to one caveat, which is that although the full analysis will cover the VNRs that have been submitted in English, Spanish, and French, the preliminary findings only apply to VNRs that were submitted in English, which is around 70% of the total of VNRs. Therefore, they do not apply to regional areas where states have primarily submitted VNRs in French and Spanish, such as Latin America and large parts of the African continent. I will now turn to the preliminary findings and I'll start by briefly mentioning the extent to which states have been reporting on SDG 16. Over the period 2016 to 2019, not all VNRs have reported on each one of the 17 goals. The preliminary findings, however, suggest that SDG 16 is addressed by the majority of the reviews, with approximately 75% of VNRs reporting on this goal. There's also been an increase over the years in the number of VNRs that have addressed SDG 16. This has been especially the case for 2018 and 2019 VNRs, as may be expected, and also given that SDG 16 was one of the goals on the review at the 2019 HLPF. Let me now turn to the extent to which SSGR is addressed in the VNRs. The SSGR terminology is lo largely absent from the reviews. There is no reference to security sector governance or SSG. Three countries, however, do make reference to SSR in their VNRs. Belgium, Norway, and Timor-Leste all mention SSR in the context of SDG 16, either to report on national processes or regarding their support to SSR programs abroad. So only a handful of countries use the SSGR terminology and make explicit use of it in the VNRs. Nevertheless, certain refuse do make reference to SSR activities, even though they do not refer to them as such. In other words, these VNRs report on SSR, although this is not explicitly labeled as SSR. I can provide a few examples, such as the case of Guyana, which mentions its efforts towards engaging in community policing and developing trainings in the field of police prosecution. And Indonesia, whose 2019 VNR identifies as a key policy for the realization of SDG 16 to enhance the transparency and accountability of law enforcement. 
So the preliminary findings suggest that various VNRs do report on SSR to promote peace and security in the context of development. I would also like to mention the role of security providers in the VNRs, and I'll focus on one specific actor here. The police is the security provider that receives most attention in the reviews, and around 75% of the VNRs make reference to the police at least once. This can be explained by the fact that law enforcement agencies, though not explicitly referred to in the 2030 Agenda, play a substantive role in achieving the SDGs. This is true for the realization of SDG 16 targets, but also other SDGs, including SDG 5 on gender equality, SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth, SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities, but also SDG 14 on life below water. The fact that the functions of law enforcement agencies cut across so many different SDGs is a clear indication of the significance of the role of security providers in promoting sustainable development. The last point that I would like to address, especially given the topic that has brought all of us here today and on which I look forward to hearing our panelists' insights, is the mention of parliaments in the VNRs. Parliaments are extensively referred to in the reviews, with only 10% of VNRs not mentioning them or mentioning, the, mentioning them only once. This reflects the essential role that legislatures play for the realization of the SDGs, as is made clear in the Agenda's declaration. However, even though parliaments are very much talked about in the VNRs, the preliminary findings suggest that they are not referred to in the context of their role as one of the most prominent oversight bodies of the security sector. While some VNRs hint at this function, for example, by highlighting new legislation allowing for reforms within security institutions, their full capacity to ensure the accountability of national security sectors remains largely unaddressed. This suggests a need for a greater emphasis on the variety of functions that parliaments hold to promote the good governance of the security sector. To conclude, and here please allow me to pull up a slide to um, present the, um, the three key preliminary findings. So the first key result is that the large majority of VNRs address SDG 16, approximately 75% of VNRs do. Second, only few VNRs makes, make explicit reference to SSGR. Nevertheless, there seems to be an awareness of the importance of reforming national security sectors towards greater accountability and efficiency to realize the ambitions of SDG 16, even if these efforts are not always labeled as SSR. Last but not least, although parliaments are extensively referred to in the VNRs, limited attention is devoted to their role in ensuring the good governance of the security sector, and greater emphasis should therefore be placed on this critical function. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexandra. And I, I think it's very interesting to see that 90% of all the VNRs have referred to Parliament, 75% of all VNRs to SSG 16, 75% of all VNRs refer to needed reform with the police and how they can contribute to the SDGs, and only a handful have uh, contributed, to, uh, have, have addressed a more comprehensive view on security sector governance reform. So I also would like to uh, uh, emphasize to the audience, this is work in progress, these are only preliminary findings, and we will extend this research to all languages and regions. So just that you know that. Then I go now to the, the speakers, and this time I think it's fair that we give first a word to Mrs. Kilatsa, of, of Georgia, and uh, what would be your key message to uh, to be conveyed in the in the in, the, in your country's future VNRs? This is class the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Born. Uh, it was very interesting to see the presentation and the key findings as well regarding your question. Um, today it is the second time Georgia present its voluntary um, national review. Now, our country has made a significant progress in several areas of SDGs, and I'm sure the speaker will cover a wide range of areas in depth. 
From my personal point of view, I wish to hear about the progress and lessons learned, what we have on the way of democratic governance and building accountable and transparent state institutions. In the light of global challenge of the pandemic, it is worth to note, that, uh, note uh, how well the state managed the crisis on the one hand and demonstrates enough flexibility to ensure civil inclusion and accountability on the other hand. I believe Georgia showed a good progress of the balance between the uh, disease control and not leaving anyone behind the activities. As mentioned, new challenges gave us uh, new opportunities and a good lesson to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, now we turn to the second speaker. And I, uh, Nepal, like uh, Georgia, but also like Costa Rica, all three states will today, incidentally today, uh, uh, present their voluntary national reviews. And just to remind everyone of, about this, the voluntary national reviews are the reports that states submit to the UN in New York to uh, 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 showcase, to highlight how they have progress on achieving the 2030 agenda. Uh, so, Dr. Bart, then I come to you. What would be your key message uh, uh, would you like to be conveyed in a future or today's uh, uh, VNR of Nepal? The floor is your Dr. Deepak Bhatt. Uh, thank you, Hans. Thank you again. Uh, in context of the uh, VNR, uh, our uh, parliamentary committees and umbrella organizations uh, in the uh, non-governmental sector, the called, the, you know, in a broader sense, civil society and UN agencies and all institutions uh, are, you know, sometimes holding uh, forums and talking about, uh, you know, accountable, transparent entities and then the uh, activities of the government. Though, as I mentioned earlier, governments is significantly, you know, working in the newer structures, which are, you know, uh, uh, as because of the federalized state, so promoting good governance, and you know, and and making you know equal responsibility at the all government tiers is is a big challenge here because as I mentioned, there is a legislatures created at the province level and executives are also there, so their oversight agent uh, mechanisms also uh, created, and and auditors general government and their role and responsibilities are uh, made more clear and like auditor general's office and, you know, like uh, abuse of authority, uh, ombudsman and, you know, like all institutions. And then at the same time, uh, you know, like uh, overall government's response regarding the BNR is, is, uh, is, is somewhere uh, sharing in the, in the, uh, these kind of forums. And here, uh, voluntary people's review was, was conducted, me meetings were held. So that also reflect the BNR and, and, and the rules. So uh, regarding the good governance practices, uh, our uh, government and parliament both are uh, in progress. So I can't uh, say that it is very uh, good in practice, but uh, as being, uh, you know, like uh, instable uh, political system uh, facing country, now we are coming out from that and role of the parliament uh, engaging multi-stakeholders, engaging, you know, all sections of, you know, like society in terms of uh, so civil society, academia and security sector, uh, especially, uh, we are focusing, we are uh, redirecting our budget to the security forces as they are uh, facing newer challenges uh, as law enforcement agencies and our provincial uh, parliaments are uh, are ready to erect new polit uh, uh, security institutions called the provincial police. So that will be the new function, a new institution, a new existence. So uh, we are, you know, the uh, federal, provincial go uh, governments are working on that. So um, this is what the, you know, uh, you know, building effective institutions is, is a big challenge here. Thank you again. Dr. Deepak Bhatt, thank you very much for for, for your insight for, uh, from, from Kathmandu. And uh, as uh, the previous speaker uh, from Georgia, you also highlight the whole issue of governance and accountability. And this should be really highlighted 
in the VNRs, uh, uh, the, uh, the accountability of governments for their steps towards as, uh, the SDGs. So now I come to Mrs. Perez Nielsen. Uh, uh, please now for you to flow. What will be your key message for future VNR of Costa Rica? What would you like to be in the voluntary national review of Costa Rica? The floor is yours. Yes, of course. Uh, Costa Rica is the first country in the world that have signed a um, national agreement to monitor the um, advance of the 2030 agenda. And it is from the national agreement and co-signatories uh, that the national voluntary report is developed. The national agreement was signed by the president of Costa Rica, the president of the parliament, the president of the Supreme Court of Justice, as well as representatives from local governments, the private sector, social and religious organization and academia. The importance of the articulation of actors, including so civil society is evident to strengthen the national governance for the achievement of the SDGs. It is important to strengthen Parliament's participation in achieving the SDGs because the legislative agenda goes through the Parliament's also due to the constitutional function, function of political control and follow-up especially that set forth by SDG 16.6. .6. The Parliament of Costa Rica in uh, 2019, through its representation before the SDG Advisory Committee under SDG 16, to contribute to good governance by inclusive and transparent decision making and taking into account their commitment with the national agreement, developed a roadmap to monitor the progress of the SDGs in Parliament next to the United Nations system of Costa Rica. This roadmap includes five areas for monitoring the 2030 agenda. Uh, there are legislation, political control, budget approval, representation and citizen participation, and internal institutional coordination and administrative action. It is for the moment. Thank you, thank you very much. And actually, uh, what your approach is and your key message is actually that that from a governance and accountability point of view, that you remember your government about the commitments that they have made and signed up to. Right? So it's not that revolutionary because they have signed up to it itself, but very important. Th thank you, thank you very much. So we, we now come to the questions of the of the audience. And we, I would just want also to announce we go a, a little bit over time, but no more than uh, 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 30 minutes. And uh, there are many questions lined up on the slido.com uh, uh, um, site, and I have them here in front of me. So uh, what I will do, I will now uh, um, raise these questions to the three speakers. Um, and then those who are most liked, because there's a ranking order, uh, uh, people could like the questions that uh, were pu pu put forward. So, and the two uh, count, two questions on the top, they are a little bit related to each other. So I would like them to bring them to ask you to answer them uh, in one go. And I will uh, start with uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Perez. And I will s mention now the question. So the first question is, are there positive outcomes in terms of increasing accountability and transparency in governance resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic? So that's the first question to the three uh, speakers. Are there positive outcomes in terms of increasing accountability and transparency in governance resulting from this uh, pandemic? And I would like that in your question, in your answer that you combine the second question also in this, which is, uh, what changes do you envision in the role of parliaments in the post-COVID-19 governance system? So I would like that you then 
focus in the answer to the positive outcomes for accountability and transparency as a result of the, this COVID-19 crisis, and that you then apply it to your own role on, on Parliament. So these are the, the two highest scoring questions. So if, th if this is clear to the three speakers, uh, Mrs. Nielsen Perez, can I start with you? Is that fine? And can you maybe limit your answer uh, in, in two minutes, please? I know it's very challenging, but uh, we cannot do it or anything else. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I said uh, that this uh, situation about the COVID-19 um, revelate um, different um, situation, uh, the discrimination, in, in the country and we are working very 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 fast uh, but we need to assure the um, uh, transparency and the um, uh, account uh, accountability about this um, the for me, the most important is the emergency as revealed a series of problems that we have been dragging out and not attending sufficiently well. It is very important because of the structural inequalities that we have, like poverty and discrimination, there are many problems that have become apparent, generating more citizen awareness of this existence and we must find a way to solve this problem. And we have a, a state of law and social responsibility with a very solid institution and with a lot of legitimacy that have managed to address the urgency of the problem. But a society, we have the work in the construction of a new social contract, because it's, it is very, very, very important for the um, democratic institution and for the uh, development of the country and the world. Thank you. Th thank you, thank you very much. Then I would now like to go to uh, uh, Dr. Bhatt from uh, Nepal. So, what is your view on, do you see any silver linings, positive outcome of this uh, pandemic for accountability and transparency? And uh, what role would Parliament play in that? Dr. Deepak Bhatt, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Hans. Uh, uh, regarding the question first, you know, like, you know, uh, is there, uh, you know, like any positive outcome regarding the, you know, increasing or that kind of uh, phenomena called, you know, account, uh, accountability and the transparency? Uh, I see, yes, the interaction is intense because, you know, with every challenge, uh, we can identify some opportunities out there. And in, in that sense, while there's a lockdown, you know, people uh, are more closely watching government activities and talking about the, you know, like procurement acts or regulations or all these things and a section of civil society and in uh, a new emerge uh, you know, like you know, media or civil society combinedly have been talking and focusing on government activities. And they are, I mean, common citizens also are realizing what government is doing or not. Uh, you know, like governance system is not only that, you know, the government function is there, you know, all, as I mentioned earlier, the multi-stakeholder phenomena and the relating it with, so, and parliamentarians also get time to link it with you know how to make you know like just an inclusive society in terms of not just mentioning in the uh, constitution or the acts and the regulations you know making you know it happen in the real in, in the practice uh, is, is a time uh, where parliamentarian or parliament committee uh, and 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 all are working so in post uh, or the post covid uh, uh, scenario in the governance system we can see that uh, the friction or uh, the friction between or the you know like interaction between or the, uh, the interfaces, uh, in, it's interfacing, so it will help uh, to uh, make just an inclusive society. I think uh, there is silver lining to become uh, 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 positive. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Then, uh, for the same question from the audience, uh, I, I will now come to uh, Mr. Sufik Glatz of Georgia. So, what do you do? You see any positive outcomes for increasing accountability and transparency after this pandemic? And uh, what role for Parliament in this? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, and the issue is that I really see the last time the tendencies, positive tendencies uh, regarding the increasing of the accountability and transparency of uh, government. First of all, the people have more interest towards the um, activities of government, especially when they are uh, aware about the uh, uh, healthcare system, about how the government is dealing with this uh, terror pandemic. So. Uh, the processes are more, much more active in the parliament, as we see as an example, I can underline um, that we have this uh, after the uh, ordinary session uh, of the spring um, session, we, we have two uh, extraordinary sessions. Uh, today is the second one, for example, and we you know, plan also two more extraordinary sessions. I think it is a record, uh, record number of, uh, of extraordinary sessions. It means that there is the increased uh, uh, role of parliament and of course uh, regarding the oversight, not only lawmaking. So um, we have uh, several, uh, uh, several more numbers of uh, uh, increased uh, uh, oversight of uh, from the parliamentary side, for example, there were several times the prime minister and the ministers uh, in different uh, directions. So I think the parliament has uh, became much more um, active in lawmaking, but also regarding the oversight function. And also, I think it will um, be kept also after the COVID-19 period. Uh, I think uh, this increased role of Parliament will stay and, of course, we will work um, in order to ensure the strong Parliament and parliamentary mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for, for your clear uh, uh, answer, which you also actually already uh, uh, hinted to the, one of the next top questions from the audience, which is, what lessons learned uh, uh, can we take for, for uh, effective parliamentary oversight me mechanism and the review of legislation of COVID-19? So actually I want to do now uh, uh, one thing that this, this question of what lessons learned for uh, uh, effective parliamentary oversight mechanism and the review of legislation, I want to combine that uh, with the next one as a special case, which was also high on the list is, uh, uh, to what extent you have dealt with, or, or, or not, uh, that we will see, with, with uh, corruption cases, as uh, uh, particularly as so many states of the emergencies have been declared, so many funding programs have started. So I know these are two different things, but uh, I, I would like that in the next round that you would combine these two questions and that you look at uh, what, lesson learned, uh, what lessons have you learned for parliamentary oversight from the COVID-19 and as a special case. So how did you account for, uh, uh, did you hold the government accountable for uh, 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 potential corruption cases uh, in amid COVID-19? So uh, let me now start with, um, uh, with Mrs. Kilatze. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I will uh, begin with your second question, the corruption cases. Of course, uh, when we are all uh, in the whole world in this extraordinary uh, situation, uh, the uh, fundings are also uh, a little bit uh, on another way. Uh, I mean, um, maybe less procedural burdens and to make things faster and, of course, the um, uh, uh, risk of corruption is increasing in such um, uh, difficult times. Uh, and we in the parliament uh, monitor, of course, such kind of issues and try to keep the government accountable uh, also in this regard. Um, I have mentioned previously, and, uh, and I will um, once again underline that so we have very often the hearings of different ministers and also the prime minister. And all the um, questions are asked openly, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, 
transmitted uh, online and via TV uh, channels and all questions are asked uh, openly and the answers are transparent and they are also from the opposition uh, side and also from the ruling um, party side, uh, different uh, questions and also criteria how the um, government uh, and um, how the government is spending the money of taxpayers. So it is not uh, an issue which is closed in our country. Uh, on the contrary, it is very transparent and open and um, all MPs have the right to ask questions. Uh, regarding the um, first um, question, uh, lessons learned, as far as I see, uh, more or less uh, uh, different countries try to do uh, its best uh, in order to uh, address this very, very difficult situation. And as far as I see, the lawmakers um, use these two main functions, so the parliamentary oversight and lawmaking to address this um, COVID-19 period. But I think we have the same challenges uh, because uh, from my point of view, Non-parliament has um, the clear, I mean, clear uh, receipt, so to say, how to address uh, mm, uh, this uh, situation in a better manner. And I think there is a huge space uh, to work also together in order to, um, uh, to make clear steps uh, how to defeat this uh, terrible uh, situation COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for this, so so uh, for your insights from from Tbilisi, uh, then we come now to Dr. Deepak Bhatt. So the the question at stake is, uh, uh, what lesson learned did you take from uh, for parliamentary oversight uh, as as uh, uh, a review of legislation of COVID nineteen, and as a special case, how how did you deal with or, or anticipated possible corruption cases in the wake of COVID nineteen? The floor is yours, Dr. Deepak. Uh, thank you. Uh, regarding the first question, yes, Parliament, uh, the session was called and with the social and the physical distancing, uh, our activities were in uh, full move and for that reason, each and every uh, and a, uh, parliamentary committee was working and uh, scrutinizing its, its uh, related ministries and how they are working and oversight mechanisms and the meetings were frequent, so uh, closely they were uh, 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 working. And, and uh, citizens, you know, the common citizens were very active. You know, all they were residing at home uh, at any condition. And for that reason, they have been you know, posing questions in media, uh, they were raising and in social media and, and you know, from YouTube and, and me, uh, all uh, uh, kinds of medias. Uh, but uh, one very important thing is like, you know, the, while I mentioned about the, its budgetary session, end of the budget session uh, and the activities of the budget were on target. So for that reason, it is uh, 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 all entities of the government at all level uh, were not very, uh, you know, like uh, the impact of the lockdown was there because uh, many uh, officers or the officials have been working from home or something like that. And uh, for that reason, public offices uh, remain closed for a uh, long time. Uh, and government at all levels were ensuring, yes, we are, uh, we are transparent and all these things. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm responding to the second question in that link. So transparency was a big question and corruption cases were there. Uh, from the Ministry of Home Affairs and, and those who are the mechanisms involved, even the questions were raised about the uh, army, you know, the Ministry of Defense and the mechanisms created to handle the COVID-19, you know, the pandemic. But uh, still, these are the, you know, like the establishments uh, explanations, but people are not satisfied with all these things. But we will, you know, like, as I mentioned, you know, the public procurement mechanisms and acts and legislations are under review. And, and these practices, uh, you know, uh, focusing and reorienting budget at the last mo few months and couple of weeks is a wrong practice. So uh, civil society can play a strong role to, you know, check uh, all these kind of oversight functions and also the 
parliament is also working on that so it's very closely uh, uh, putting questions is not only the thing but uh, you know uh, as uh, maybe government is reluctant to you know provide you know the, all all these things but uh, people have uh, drawn them and media has bring it uh, in the surface thank you very much uh, dr deepak uh, that you uh, have shared these insights uh, from uh, Kathmandu with us. That's very much appreciated. So we come now with the same questions to the last panelist, Mrs. Nielsen Perez. So also to you the question, what lesson learned did you take for, for parliamentary oversight as, uh, as part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the responses of the government to that? And the other question as a special case, how, how did you deal with any potential or dissipated any potential issues with corruption? Uh, uh, as part of the uh, state of emergency was declared, a lot of funding then to society. Uh, so the floor is yours, Mrs. Nielsen Perez. One, one moment. Yes, um, about the, we, we have a, a different functions. The supervisor and con political control are the, the most important for, for me uh, in this moment uh, because we are working very fast and very intensive. And, but we have a lot of forms of the political control and supervisor. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, it is very important to use the um, technology tools that we have. Um, the other function is uh, about the knowledge and approval the budget. Um, we are modifying the regulation of the parliament to shorten uh, the time to knowledge and approval of extraordinary budgets for the attention of the national emergency uh, by COVID-19. Um, to be meet uh, virtually, but it is imp very important uh, safeguarding among all the principle of publicity and transparency and no corruption because uh, we are speaking about the budget for the emergency and uh, it is not possible to use uh, this budget in activities uh, uh, that's not important in this emergency. And um, we are working um, in this case for protect the budgets, for, the, for protect the money, because we know the state knew and the governments knew a lot of money in this moment to protect uh, peoples. And, to budget uh, different uh, products for to protect peoples, and uh, we are um, legislate very strong to um, to assegurate a strengthening mechanism for monitoring and control of public resources aimed at protection of people who have had uh, their income reduced. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Nilsa Perez. Uh, that was very much appreciated. So there are many more questions raised by the audience, but because, but because of you of time, we, can, we cannot answer the, uh, further other questions while, while they were very pertinent and very, very uh, uh, relevant. So, uh, uh, but I think we need now to come to a conclusion from this uh, 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 webinar. And as part, before I say my uh, end remarks, I would like uh, to give every speaker, panelist, uh, op the possibility to say in one sentence, to say in one sentence what you have learned from this discussion. I know it's very challenging, but this is how it is. So, uh, uh, and I come first to Mrs. Perez and then to Dr. Bat and then to Mrs. Kelatze. So each of you, please say in one sentence, what did you learn from this discussion? So Mrs. Nielsen Perez, the floor is yours.
Oh, okay, thank you. In one sentence, um, I believe that it is very important to strengthen the technical capacities of the parliaments and the assistances of the United System to accelerate the achievement of the uh, 2030 agenda. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for keeping to the to the mandate to, to do it only one sentence. Thank you so much and also very spot on. So Dr. Deepak, but uh, uh, I come to you. What, how would you formulate in one sentence what you have taken away from this debate? Uh, during this uh, health crisis, COVID-19, Parliament's responsibility has become more uh, reinforced uh, to make more effective oversight for you know like just an inclusive society and scrutinize activities of the government and law enforcement agencies and uh, help them in each and every step uh, to respond and make policies thank you thank you so much then uh, uh, very much appreciated without further ado i go to mrs kelatsa how would you formulate in one sentence the key takeaway of this debate thank you Thank you. I think uh, all the parliaments have to work very hard in order to implement SDG 16, especially in this uh, difficult COVID-19 period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, then I come to the closing, a uh, uh, few closing uh, remarks. I, I just want to wrap up now the webinar in, in, in a few sentences. First of all, I would like to uh, uh, reiterate uh, that this side event that we have organized with Costa Rica was one of the quite a few events that uh, that we organized in this year to focus on the role of parliaments in achieving the SDG 16 targets. Some of our colleagues, the speakers have already referred to that this uh, uh, webinar builds upon uh, a, a conference that we had a, a webinar also organized uh, uh, in Sweden uh, on uh, the Stockholm Forum on Peace and Development. Uh, and this is this year and next year we will focus on civil society and one year later on ombuds institutions. If you would like to remain updated about these events, please feel free to contact us. I also would like to remind you that we have recorded this event. We will post it online. We will also circulate a report which we will uh, disseminate among everyone who has participated. Uh, uh, in this event and we will supply you with more information when it comes available. So finally, I would like to thank uh, 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 Ambassador Carazzo and his staff at the Permanent Missions of Costa Rica to making this event possible. I also would like to thank to the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and The Hague for the financial support to make this project and this webinar possible, and as well as uh, uh, for Georgia and Nepal to also support this event. It's very, very much uh, uh, appreciated. So then I also would like to thank my colleagues at DCAF. Uh, uh, and these are Merle Jasper, Alexander Prepri, and Will McDermott for the ex excellent backup, but also the conceptualization and the continuous uh, uh, context that we had with Costa Rica and, and uh, Mission and with the three speakers. So most of all, I would like to thank uh, 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 and give a very big thank you to Mrs. Perez, Mrs. Kilatz, and Dr. Bart for taking the time out of their very, very busy schedule and to be here with us. Thank you so much. If we would now be in real life together, I would offer you some Swiss chocolate and other token of our uh, gratitude. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank also uh, 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 the, the participants, the audience for being with us and also for raising so many relevant and in interesting questions. So thank you very much. And with this, I come to the end of this uh, event. I would like to say to all of you, stay safe and see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.